Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? I, I, let's just start in prayer. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We come together today in your house, Father God. We thank you, Lord, that your will will be done in this place. And I thank you, Father God, that as I minister this morning, that my speech and my, my preaching, it won't be with enticing words of man's wisdom, Father God, but it in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Father God, that you will put the words in my mouth that you want me to say, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, that the people will be ministered to and that lives will be touched and changed forever in your presence, Father God, because we are changed from glory to glory. And we worship you and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, most of you know me and you've known me for a long, long time, but I don't know why I just felt impressed. The Holy Spirit just wanted me to tell a little bit about myself. Well, I was born again at the age of four. My dad's been my pastor my entire life, except for small little pieces when we went to other churches, but he was always like the associate pastor even then. So he's pastored me my entire life. But he said when I was four years old, of course, I don't hardly remember this, but he said I had tears rolling down my eyes and I walked down the aisle to give my life to the Lord at four. Amen. Amen. And even at a young age, I would take, they had these little plant stands, and I would take the plant stands, I would take the plants off, I would turn the plant stands upside down, and I would set my stuffed animals on them, and Dad said I would preach to the stuffed animals. <laughs> you know, and as I grew up, I knew that I had a call of God on my life, but I didn't quite understand I didn't see doors opening going out into other places, you know. And I was just like, I've always felt the most content here in the house helping Dad. And one year when I was a youth at Rama Youth Camp, a minister, he called me up, and he called up Rebecca and me and Dad, and he told us to link arms. Now, if Jeremy and Caitlin and Quincy would have been there, they weren't around yet. They weren't youth yet. <laughs> if they would have been there, he'd have had us all link arms, I'm sure. But it was just me and Rebecca and Dad. <clears throat> Mama wasn't there either. But, so he had us link arms, and he prophesied over us. And he told us, he said, you're called to, to stand beside and to help your father in ministry. And I've always felt that was my calling. Whatever he asked me to do, I did it. You know, I started out helping Mom teach the children. Well, even before that, we cleaned. <laughs> I mean, we did stuff. We did whatever needed to be done, but I taught the kids. Then, you know, I moved up. They asked me to, to preach to the youth. And so then I taught the youth. And then I became the praise and worship leader. I don't even know the order of these things, but, they, you know, these are just different things. I've been the praise and worship leader for over 25 years now. I was thinking about that, and I was like, how can that be? I'm only 25. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been the praise and worship leader for 25 years. And, you know, some you <laughs> and Mama said people think we're sisters, and they really do. They say that all the time. And um, sometimes they tell that to Rebecca, too, and she gets mad because she thinks that they must be saying she looks old. But I, I just think that we all look young, but Mama looks really young, so that's why they say that to us. Amen? But, you know, <laughs> as I was studying and I was thinking about the service and Dad had asked me to preach, and he actually asked me if I wanted a Wednesday or Sunday, and normally I'm like mom and I would say Wednesday because, you know, on Sunday I'm up here two services and, and I knew Tyler was going to be out and I'd have to be playing bass and that's really not my jam. And, you know, I just like hold on as best as I can, but I'm not, you know, proficient at it like he is. And so I knew I was going to be thinking about that and doing that as well. But I just felt in my heart impressed that, that Sunday was the day I was supposed to preach. And so as I was go going leaving home from church a couple of weeks ago, and this really never happens to me. God usually gives me a subject to study out, or he tells me something he wants to say, and then, you know, as an afterthought, I will come up with a title to give the people just to put on the, the series of whatever online. But I heard the Spirit of God say to me, I want you to teach on a tale of two churches. I said, a tale of two churches? I said, you mean like a tale of two cities? That, when, I was, when I was younger, that was one of my favorite books. I love the tale of two cities. And it starts, the tale of two cities starts out and it says it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You know, that could be said of the world right now. If you don't know who you are in Christ and you don't know the things he's provided for you, it can be the worst of times. People are freaking out about the cost of groceries. They're freaking out about the price of rent. I see people all the time saying, I can't afford to live by myself. They're looking for roommates. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. Later on, it goes to say it was a season of light, it was a season of darkness, it was a spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. 
You know, and that could describe the world. The world is in despair right now. But you know, one of the problems is, is that some of the churches are in just as much despair as the world. Churches that don't know their identity in Christ, they don't know their authority, they're in just as much trouble as the world is. So, as I was talking to the Lord, I said, what do you want me to talk about this tale of two churches? And he started talking to me about some of the differences between churches. And so, just for the sake of the sermon, I'm going to contrast and talk about two hypothetical churches. Church A is thriving, it's alive, it's growing, it's building. They're planning on building, they're in a, a building project. They have happy volunteers. They're reaching the community and even the world for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, Church B is dead. It's declining in membership. They really don't have many young people, many kids. They hold on to what little money they have. They're greedy. They don't help people out. It has a lot of issues, a lot of rifts, a lot of splits. And it's just dead. So that's Church B. So God said, I want you to look at we're going to talk about a couple of major differences between these churches. Now, there's all kinds of differences between those kind of churches. I mean, and we could be here all day. I could talk about all kinds of things. But God gave me five major points. So I want to talk about five major points between these two types of churches. The first thing God said, a church that's thriving and a church that's dying, one of the biggest differences between it is honor. So number one is honor. The definition in Greek of honor is to value something. It's valuable. It's worthy. It has a weight to it. We assign things honor or value all the time. You know, whether it's money or sentimental value. We assign things honor. If you have a Rolex and you have a cheap watch that came in a box from Walmart, you probably don't treat those two watches the same way because you've assigned it value. If you're taking notes, write this down. The level of honor you give is determined by the amount of value that you perceive. The level of honor you give is determined by the amount of value that you perceive. But see, the problem with things is, is that we're looking at the value that we perceive. We're being the judge of what's valuable and what's not valuable. But God says, I've made things valuable. I've made these people valuable. We look at people and we say, oh, because you have this, because you have this gift or because you have this amount of money or you have this amount of education whatever it may be we assign value to people but that's not what God looks at right. we're knowing people according to the flesh but God is looking at what he's done through us through Jesus that's how he sees us amen, amen. and that's how we're supposed to see people you know <clears throat> example I'm going to give you is my rings you know my rings they don't have a huge monetary value you know, when we first got married, I mean, Andrew was just starting in his job, and I mean, we didn't have a lot, and what he had, he went to the store, and he told the guy what he wanted, and, and the guy gave him a ring. So, I mean, it's worth something, but it's not a huge monetary value. But to me, it's priceless. Right. You see? I mean, there's been times and times he's tried to tell me, oh, I want to replace your ring. I want to get you a bigger ring. I don't want another ring. Amen. This is the ring I was proposed to with. This other ring is the ring I got married with. I don't want another ring. So, to me, it's priceless. But see, when I work out, and it's getting kind of loose because I've lost a little bit of weight. I'm trying to lose some more, Lord. <clears throat> but it's a little bit loose. So when I play sports, when I swim or when I do anything like that, I wear this rubber wedding band. I take these off and I leave them in my jewelry box and I wear this rubber one. Now, if this rubber one falls off my finger, I could care less. I've got 25 of these at home. <laughs> I bought them off of Amazon. They cost like $5. <laughs> You know, I'll just buy more. It, I mean, but these are the ones I wear when I'm doing something active. They don't mean anything to me. So, <laughs> it's the value that you assign something. I assign value to my rings. This one, no value. But the problem is, is we do this a lot in church. Well, in, when we talk about honor in church, it's easy to think to yourself, well, I don't show dishonor. I don't, talk, I don't talk about the pastor. I don't run him down. I don't run down leadership. I don't run him in the ground. I'm not, I don't, I'm not, I've heard this sermon before on honor. I don't show dishonor. But listen, do you know how easy it is to slip into dishonor? 
If honor is assigning value to something or someone, dishonor can be as simple as just treating them as common. You don't have to talk about them to be dishonoring. You can just treat them as common. Like, like this cheap thing, it's just common. You may not be running them on the ground, but when you think of them as common, you're dishonoring them. In Mark chapter 6, do you remember when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath? He started saying, the people started saying, how does this man, how does Jesus know all this stuff? How, how does he have all this wisdom? How is he performing all these miracles? Isn't he just Mary's son? Aren't those his sisters sitting over there? Isn't he just the carpenter? You know, he works down the road. I, I took some stuff to him to get fixed. He fixed it the other day. He's just the carpenter. How's he, how's he have all this wisdom? And the Bible says that they were offended at him. Why in the world would they be offended at him just because they knew him and because he was proclaiming the things of God in the Word? It's because people are that way. See, we're supposed to be preferring our brothers and sisters, but they looked at him, and they looked at him as equal, and they said, and they, in their minds they thought, he's trying to make himself out to be more than we are. So they were offended. But Jesus had found himself in the Word, and he knew, where, he knew who he was. How many, and don't raise your hand now, don't raise your hand, <laughs> but how many of you have ever thought to yourself, or just had maybe a slight, this is a slight little thing when you found out that pastor's not preaching. Maybe Tyler's preaching. And you're like, oh, I mean, here, here's this kid. He's just 18. He's just Josh and Rebecca's son. He's, he's Ralph and Diane's grandson. Huh? He's 20. I don't know how he is. He's 20. <laughs> <laughs> to, to me, he's still the little redheaded. He's my little tie tie. Yeah. But, but when he's up here preaching, I don't look at him as little tie tie. When he's up here preaching, I look at him and I see the gifting and the anointings and the callings on the inside of him. I see the call of the evangelist. I see when he's preaching. I see when he steps over to that office and I sit there and I pull on that gift and I receive. I don't see him as my little tie-tie, you know? But, you know, it's easy for us to know people after the flesh. It's easy to say when Rebecca's up here, oh, I've known her whole life. We've been in this church and when she came here, she was just a little thing. Or the same with Josh. Or the same with Milton. You know, people might, when Milton's up here preaching, they might say, oh, we went to school with Milton. We know all of his sisters and everybody. And that's just Milton. We know how he is. He's crazy. You know, I mean. <laughs> but no, that's not, what, that's not what God wants us to do. We're not to know people after the flesh. Especially when you're standing in this pulpit, like Mom said, Dad is not going to just have anybody stand up here. If you don't know the word, you're not getting in this pulpit. And if you come in this pulpit and you speak something that's not the word, you won't be back. <laughs> I, I've witnessed it. I've been here before and I've witnessed, witnessed it. So, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 4, Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Why is it that people in your own house will show you the most dishonor? In your own house. You know, I've been watching... Uh, the, the meetings in Mexico, I've been, I've been watching it online, and I tell you what, you know, I'm not saying, I know we, we honor our pastors here, but I'm telling you what, there's something about when he steps over to another country, I mean, they, they double dog honor. I mean, they take it to a next level, and they are pulling, and they're receiving, and they do praise and worship for forever, and then they get up and they have minister it's preach and they preach and they preach and they preach and they want more. And then they're liable to do praise and worship again. I mean, they're just going and going and going because they're honoring the gifts on the inside. And they want to draw. And they're there for a purpose. Amen? So, we see the results of dishonor in Mark 6, verse 5. It said, and he could dare do no mighty work save that he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. Now, J.B. Phillips' translation says, and he could do nothing miraculous there apart from laying his hands on a few sick people. He could do nothing miraculous. The Amplified Version says he was not able to do one work of power. Not one work of power. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Dishonor shuts down the miraculous and stops the flow of power. I'm going to say it again. Dishonor shuts down the miraculous 
and stops the flow of power. Let me tell you, I hope that it, it, you don't come to this place, but for most people, there's a time in your life coming when you need a miracle. There will be times to pop up where you need something. You need a miracle. It's serious. It's dire. And I tell you what, you need people to be standing in your corner. You need people with you, amen? So, if you've been dishonoring, it's shutting down that flow. You don't want that flow shut down. And I tell you what, there are sometimes when it's such a grave situation, and I'm not talking about your stubby toe, that you can handle that yourself, but I'm saying when it's something horrible, I mean, what if your kid was in a wreck or something like that? I mean, we plead the blood, but I'm saying there's been times when people have called and something bad was going on and they needed pastor, they needed the office, the anointings, the giftings that he stands in as their pastor. They needed to call on that. And they, and they call him up. But what happens if they've been calling him old boy, well, old boy, so-and-so, old boy, and so-and-so. See, they're not going to get the giftings and the callings and the anointings in the office of pastor. When they call, they're going to get old boy. That's what they're going to get. You know? If you're calling him old boy and talking to him, uh, you know, just common and knowing him after the flesh, well, that's all that he's going to be able to give to you because you're not going to be able to pull that other thing out of him. And it's not that he won't do it on his own. He would give anybody anything he could. If he could just hand out miracles, he would because he has such a giving, generous heart. And I know, I know them as my, not just my pastor, but as my dad. I've seen how he gives and gives and he's been over backwards for people who really didn't deserve it. You know? But he would just give and give and give. But that's not how it works. Faith is what draws things out of people. And see, if you've been calling him old boy... Or you've been knowing him after his flesh. Or you've just been looking at him as common and not giving the honor. When you need that gifting and those anointings, you're not going to be able to draw it out. You see? So, now, and not only, and not only him. You know, what if he's out of the country? And if mom, what if they're out of the country? And, and they're, you can't get a hold of them or something. And what if you need to go next online and you need to get in contact with one of the associate pastors? Have you been showing them honor? Do you show honor to one another? See, the Bible says it's not just ministers that we should show honor to. The scripture talks about honoring others over 147 times. God cares about honor and it's important to him. And if it's important to God, it's important to me. We have to begin to see everyone, everything, co-workers, family members, church members, as valuable because God sees you as valuable. God sees you as valuable. You're important to him. And he's not looking at one of you and saying, thinking, oh, you're way more valuable than you are. You're more valuable. No, he loves us all the same. And we're created in his image. And that's how he wants us to love. Amen? He wants us to look at everyone as valuable. Don't treat people in this church as common. Don't don't treat the teachers that teach the children as common. If you treat them as common, if you dishonor them, your children are going to dishonor them. You know, if a teacher comes to you and they tell you your kid is acting up and doing this kind of way, don't get in the car and talk to the kid about it and run them down to your kid. Then your kid's going to show dishonor. You're planting seeds of dishonor in your children when you do that. And your children won't be able to call on the miraculous. That flow will be stopped in their life. Don't dishonor the praise team. You know? I mean, I know everybody has their favorite songs. I have my favorite song. You know? But whatever songs that we pick out, it's not because we just willy-nilly felt like, I'm going to do this song today, I'm going to do this song. Well, he hadn't done this one in a while. No, I pray and I ask God, you know, I try to go off of my spirit what he wants me to sing that day. And a lot of times it'll, it'll line right up with what pastor's preaching. You know? And so I'll know that I was hearing from the Spirit. But when you treat the praise team as common, you know, you might say, well, well, my gosh, I mean, they don't sound like elevation or they don't sound like whatever. Well, you know, we're not all professional musicians, but I can tell you one thing. I know the anointing. A, a lot of praise teams, they might sound amazing. They might could cut record deals, but I tell you what, I wouldn't trust them to pray for me if I really needed help, you know? If I really needed to press in, Amen. I'm gonna tell you what. I'm. I know. I, I know a little bit musically, but I'm gonna tell you one thing I know, and that's the spirit. I remember when I was teaching the youth years and years ago. I was praying to God about how 
I said, how do I get revival started in the youth group? Like y'all were experiencing. I wanted to see, I wanted the youth to see God move. See, because a lot of us had grown up in church, and we knew all about church. I mean, there was hardly a scripture you could tell us that we hadn't heard because we've been in church our whole lives. And when I was teaching the youth, a lot of the youth that I had at the time were the same way. They'd grown up in church. But what they hadn't seen was a mighty move of God. And I was praying, and I asked God, I said, how do I bring revival to these young kids? And you know what he told me? He said, start having praise and worship with them. We didn't even have a band. We didn't have anything. So I, I, I mean, this is how long ago it was, but I brought my stereo, you know, a big one with the things. And I put it in the room, and I just put on praise music. And I said, you know what, God, the only way I know to get your presence in this place is for me to get in your presence. So I just told the kids, here's what we're doing. We're going to praise and worship God. And at first, it was just me and the other leader and maybe one or two kids praising God. But I tell you what, the glory fell. Because I know how to get in the presence of God. Amen? So the glory would fall, and they, and they started feeling it. And the other kids started praising, praising God. And the other kids started worshiping. And all of a sudden, we have a whole bunch of youth that are in, the, in there worshiping God. And it got to the point where we started laying hands on people. And I told God, I said, God, I want them to feel the power of God. And I will never forget, I laid hands on a youth one night, and they went across the room about 10 feet. And I thought, wow, that's never happened before. <laughs> but... It, they, were, they were falling out under the power of God, but they weren't getting back up. Some of them were laying on the floor before the Lord knocked out under the power of God for so long that their parents were, the church would be over, and their parents were coming to get them and having to pull them up and throw them in the car because they couldn't even walk to the car. But that all happened because I said to God, I want your presence of God, and he said, get in my glory. Get in through praise and worship. Enter in. See, this church knows how to enter in. We've been taught. We've been taught how to enter in. And so don't come in and, and, and have an attitude of dishonor. Amen? And I'm not saying, oh, don't glorify us. No, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. At all. It's all about glorifying God. Amen? But your attitude towards the place and toward the people, it makes all the difference. It can turn on the miraculous or shut it off. Amen? Amen. Romans 12 Verses 9 and 10 in the Amplified Bible, the classic edition says, Let your love be sincere, a real thing. Hate what is evil. Loathe all ungodliness. Turn in from horror, from wickedness, but hold fast to that which is good. Love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family, giving precedence and showing honor to one another. Now, the Passion Translation, I love the way it says this. It says, Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. See, Church A, the thriving church, they're trying to outdo each other in respect and honor. Amen. Amen. What if we all purpose through ourselves, I'm going to outdo my neighbor in honor? Amen. Wouldn't that be awesome? That would be a good thing to win. I have the prize for showing the most honor. Wow, that's a great prize to have. Amen. Church B, on the other hand, they don't show honor. They just look at people like their flesh. They don't see them the way Jesus sees them. Amen? Okay, the, number, the second thing that God talked to me about, the difference between the thriving church and the dead church, is excitement. I heard a pastor say while he was preaching in Mexico, if you don't get excited about the things of God, you'll never have the things of God. If you don't get excited about the things of God, you'll never have the things of God. And I wrote it down. But you know what? It, it goes further. I was thinking, if you don't get excited about healing, you'll never have healing. Amen. If you don't get excited about prosperity, you won't have prosperity. Now, you might have it the world's way. But I tell you what, if the world gives it to you, the world can take it away. If you get it God's way, then the world's not taking it away. Amen? So you have to be excited. Charles Spurgeon said, if sinners are zealous in their sins... Should not saints be zealous for their God? If sinners are zealous in their sins, should not saints be zealous for their God? You know, sinners, they're committed to going hard. They really are. Have you ever heard people talking about sinners now? Have you ever been around sinners? You hear them talking about the weekend. Oh, buddy, they're living for the weekend. I mean, they're talking about, they're planning it out. They know exactly what they're do, doing. I mean, they're going to this, they're going to get this, they're going to do this, they're going to blow it out. I mean, we're having a good time, you know? They're going to go hard for the devil. 
But you know, what if Christians were the same way? What if all week we're talking about, oh man, I can't wait till Sunday. I'm going to get in the house. I am going hard for God. Amen? You know, the Beastie Boys, I'm showing my age here, but they had a song. <laughs> it says, it said, you have to fight for your right to party. Well, I tell you what, sometimes you have to fight for your right to come in this house and to worship God. You know why you have to fight? You have to fight the flesh because Satan will do everything he can do to stop you. He wants to stop you in your tracks. If he can make you argue with somebody on the way to church, he's going to make you argue with them. If he can make your kids act crazy and a fool on the way to church, he's going to do it. But so I'm telling you what, you have to fight for your right. It's a right. We have a privilege to come into this house and to worship and to praise the God. Amen? And we have to fight for it. You know, I uh, play pickleball with this guy. Um, he's a nice guy, but bless his heart, he's not saved. But he was telling me that he's going on a cruise next week. And he said, I tell you what, he said, the first two days of that cruise, he said, I'm not doing anything but drinking. He said, for the first two days, I am going to just drink, drink, drink. He's like, and then the third day, I'm going to start playing pickleball. <laughs> I'm like, how in the world is he going to play pickleball after two days of drinking? I don't know. I'd like to see it myself a little bit. But, but he said, for two days. And you know what? I was th <laughs> you know, on cruises, I think sometimes you can get those inclusive packages. Maybe the drinking is coming. And on the way to church, now I thought this was good. You know, a lot of times preacher get up, preachers get up and they say, on the way to church, God spoke to me and told me this. And I was always thinking, man, God really talks a lot to these people. Like, you know, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, on the way to church, God made me think about that guy. And he said this to me. He, he said this to me. Because I was thinking, I don't know why I thought about one-way church, but I thought that dude must have an all-inclusive package. I mean, the, the alcohol must be included. And, and this is what God said to me. He said, your salvation is an all-inclusive package paid for by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Your salvation is an all-inclusive package. He didn't just get you your salvation. He redeemed you. He paid for your victory in every area. He paid for your healing. He paid for your prosperity. And he paid for your peace of mind and a lot of other things. It's all inclusive. You don't just have to stop at salvation. Amen? It's all included. I, I, I thought, man, that is awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why is it, though, that some of the wildest, most extroverted sinners will turn into the shyest, most introverted Christians? When you were a sinner, a lot of you, I bet some of you, if you think back, you can remember some crazy wild days. You know? Don't think too hard. But I don't want you going back to the old man. But I'm just saying, some of you could. But a lot of times people, they get saved, and all of a sudden they're going to turn into a shy, introverted Christian. Romans 12, 11 in the King James Version, it says, We are to be fervent in spirit. The definition of fervent is having or displaying a passionate intensity, hot, burning, or glowing. In the Amplified Classic, Romans 12, 11 says, Never lag in zeal and in earnest endeavor. Be aglow and burning with the Spirit, serving the Lord. Now, this is for my mom. The Greek word for zeal <laughs> is zeo. Z-E-O. <laughs> it means to be so hot that you're boiling over. But that's the liquid form. In the solid form, it means to be so hot that you're glowing. Like when iron is put in the fire. You know when they pull it out, how it's just glowing? That's how hot that we're supposed to be for the things of God. Amen. We're supposed to be boiling over and glowing. The Passion Translation, and I'm just telling you, I love the Passion Translation always. I mean, if you don't have one, get one. The Passion Translation says, Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward Him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let Him fill you with excitement as you serve Him. Let this hope burst forth within you, releasing a continual joy. When I was reading this, it made me think of a passage of Scripture that when I was younger, I don't know why, but this passage used to vex me more than any other passage in the Bible. It really did. Like, I think sometimes I was almost tormented by this Scripture. I'm going to explain it in a minute. 
But Revelation 3, let's start in verse 13. It says, He who can hear, let him listen to, and I'm going to read the Amplified Classic, let him listen to and heed what the Spirit says to the assembly churches. Skip verse 14, number 15 says, I know your record of works and what you're doing. God knows what you're doing. I know whether you're cold or hot, and I would that you were cold or hot. He says, I wish, this, I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered and grown wealthy, I am in need of nothing. And you do not realize and understand that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to purchase from me gold refined and tested by the fire, that you may be truly wealthy, and white clothes to clothe you, and keep the shame of your nudity from being seen, and salve to put on your eyes that you may see. Now, just to reference, Job 22, 25 says, to make the Almighty your gold and the Lord your precious silver treasure. So he says to purchase from me gold refined and tested by the fire. And God says, I'm gold. I'm your precious treasure. Verse 19 says, Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults and I convict them. I convince and reprove and chasten them. I discipline and instruct them. So be enthusiastic and earnest and burning with zeal and repent, changing your mind and attitude. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and listens to and heeds my voice, and opens the door, I will come to him, and I will eat with him, and he will eat with me. Now, when I was a teen, I'm going to tell you why that, that, that scripture used to get me so bad. Because I just thought, God, and I don't know why I couldn't read the rest of the scripture, and then I would have understood. <laughs> but I thought to myself, God, how could, you, how could you just say you would rather me be cold than hot? I mean, I've got to be all the way, like, you know, cutting somersaults. I mean, I've got to be like hot to the point of boiling over but I mean it not surely lukewarm better than being all the way cold isn't it I mean in my mind in my teenage mind that's what I was thinking like it, why you have to be all the way on this road on one ditch or the other I mean even in the middle is better than all the way cold right that's what I was thinking but no the answer to that if I would have just really read you know insult the Lord the answer is right there in the verse uh, 17 because he says, uh, hold on. Uh, yeah, he's, in verse 17, this is what the people say. They say, I'm rich, I've prospered and gone wealthy, I'm in need of nothing. I'm in need of nothing. See, that's, that's, the, that's the reason why he doesn't want people to be lukewarm. Right. It's because, you know, there's a danger in getting in a place where you think you're satisfied. Right. Like you come in, you've got all you need. You don't need any more. You're fine. You know, I, my bills are being paid. I'm not having to believe God. Like I've come to a level where, I, where I'm comfortable. You know, I don't need to press in like I used to. When I first came, but this is the thing. Sinners know that they're, they're, they're sinners. They know that they're in need of God. The majority of sinners, they know right where they're at. But a lot of Christians are in denial about where they really are in their walk with the Lord. They think they're fine. But really they're not. Because when we're being excited about things of God, when we're showing the zeal that God says that we're supposed to be showing, we're boiling over hot. We're excited about the things of God. But see, too many Christians are, have grown complacent. They're just sitting here in a place where you, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, I... I know that the Holy Spirit's moving and they're all laughing and jumping around and running and whatever. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, you know in, in your mind, you may think, well, they need to do that because they need a breakthrough. I don't, I, I don't need a breakthrough, so I'm good. You know? But, but God said there's levels. There's always another level to attain to. And he doesn't want you getting complacent at the level that you're at because there's another level. Amen? So, are you boiling over? Are you glowing? Ask yourself. Take inventory. Am I boiling over in my zeal, in my excitement for the Lord? Am I aglow with the things of God? Amen? Sometimes we don't realize that our wood's wet. You know, that's a, that's a term that preachers like to say a lot. Is your wood wet? You know, but I, I used to watch these survival shows, and it seems like people, 
you know, they always need to like find a clean source of water and they need to make a fire and whatever. But a lot of times the wood was too wet. They couldn't get it started. You know, it was hard. And they would, they would be, you know, get the leaves together and they, you know, they're blowing, they're trying to get it started, but the wood was wet. So they can never really get a big fire going. It might would just smolder a little bit. And see, a lot of Christians, that's where they're at this morning. They're just in the smoldering. They're just smoldering a little bit. But no, God says, I want you a fire. I want you a flame, amen? amen? So when we're talking about two different kinds of churches, church A, they come to church already glowing. You know? And, you know, I'm sure a lot of you do this, but if you don't, on Sunday mornings, I challenge you, get up. From the time you get up, start praying in the Holy Spirit. Put you on some good praise and worship music or some preaching and, and, and just start praying. And when you're getting ready, when you're putting on your makeup, when you're taking a shower, just be praying in the Holy Ghost. On the way to church, teach your kids, you know, half the family. We're putting on praise music. We're, we're spending time with God on the way to church. And that way when you come in, you're ready. And the, and the praise team is not up here, <laughs> you know, we're not having to blow to get the fire stoked up. Because you come in and you're already on fire. And you know what? Then, hey, hey, you don't even know. We might hit another level. You know? We might, songs might come forth from the Spirit that we've never sung before. Because y'all came in ready and you're creating that atmosphere. Amen? Amen. So, that's the difference in the two churches. The one's aglow. The one's ready. And the other comes, comes in. They, they hadn't thought about God all, that whole morning other than just to get in the car and say that we're going to church. It's a routine. It's just a routine. The same as going to work or anywhere else people go to. It's not, it's not done on purpose, with a purpose. They're not thinking about the things of God before they get there. Now, Dad's talked about this before, but do you know the difference between being a thermometer or a thermostat? Each one of us can be a thermometer or a thermostat. A thermometer reads the room, the temperature in the room. If it's hot in the room, it tells you that it's hot. If it's cold, it tells you it's cold. A thermometer tells you the temperature of the room. So a thermometer just comes in and says, hey, it's cold. It's cold in here. <laughs> a thermostat regulates the temperature. It helps control the temperature in the room by making small adjustments. If it gets too cold in the room, the thermostat says, hey, we need to kick it up. We need to warm it up some. Right. Now, which one are you? If you come in and the room's cold, do you just blend right in and say, well, uh, 67 degrees. All right, I'm there. <laughs> or do you come in and say, hey, it's a little chilly. Well, let, me, let me notch this thing up a little bit. And you start creating that atmosphere, and you start changing things around you. Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? And I tell you what, the thing about it is, is a lot of times we only view that in, in, in the light of seeing it for ourselves. Like, if I come in and I press in, I'm going to get this. But you know what? We need to see it as more than that because if we come in and we press in and we change the atmosphere, we're, cre we're changing the atmosphere for not just ourselves but for everyone. Amen. Now, what if someone comes that's lost in sin? What if somebody comes with addictions? What if somebody comes that's never been in this kind of service before, but the Holy Spirit just let them here? They just knew they had to get to this place this morning for some reason. We've had people tell us that. I don't know why, but God just said, go to that church this morning. Now, if, if this place, if you came in and it was cold, and they come in and it's cold, well, it might not ever get to a place where the miracles that are flowing that they need for their life, and we might not ever get to a place where they can get it. But when you look at it as, I come in and I'm creating the atmosphere of God, I want you to be able to do what you can do. I want you to be able to touch people. I want you to be able to minister to people. I want you to have your way in this place. When you come in and you create that kind of atmosphere and the miracles are flowing, it's not just about us, people. We've got to stop thinking about things in just the view of us. Right. Amen? Amen? So, <clears throat> church B, when they come to church, they just go with the flow. The dead church, they just go with the flow. If everyone around them gets excited and it's their favorite song, you know, they may raise their hands a little bit. May, may. But overall, they just want to read the room and blend in. You know, church A is not afraid to stand out. They're not to be afraid to be the first one to run. 
the first one to shout, the first one to dance in the Holy Ghost, the first one to get their praise on. They're not afraid. They don't want to just blend in like church be. You know, have you ever been told to blend in? One time, I was in high school, and I, I went somewhere I shouldn't have been just because I wanted to hang out with my friends. But I went, I went to a party. And it, it, wasn't, it was at somebody's house I didn't know, first of all, first mistake. Why, why do you go places? Kids don't ever go places if you don't know, even know who the people are. So, so I went to this place, and this party was much bigger than I intended it to be. I, I, I thought there would be. And, and some of my friends, their older brothers and sisters that were college-age kids were running the party, and that probably tells you how it was to start with. But, I mean, I wasn't doing anything. I was just walking around, talking to people. And everybody kept asking me for a beer. I mean, do you want a beer? Here, do you want a drink? Do you want a beer? Do you want a drink? And every time I'm saying, no, thanks, no, thanks, no, I don't drink, no, whatever. Well, I don't know why, but the friend that I went with, she felt the need to explain more every time. She's like, her daddy's a pastor. She doesn't drink. She don't, I mean, she's like, she's like needing to go into detail every single time. So finally, and I don't know why she felt like she needed to do that. I mean, I was saying, no, no, thanks, no, 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 no. But she's going all those details. So finally, about after about the hundredth time, she says, can you just hold a beer? You don't even have to drink it. But can you just hold it so they will stop asking? See, she wanted me to blend in because she didn't want to have to explain anymore. But see, I don't want to blend in. I just wanted to be there to talk to people. The Holy Spirit does not want you to blend in. Amen? He does not want you to blend in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank you, Father God, whatever he wants. I thank you, Father, that he has it now in the name of Jesus. We're not called to blend in. So, Romans 12, 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But listen to what J.B. Phillips' translation says in Romans chapter 12, 2. It says, Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. Don't let the world squeeze you to its mold. Young guys, don't let the world squeeze you to its mold. But let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in, the, in practice that the plan of God for you is good. Let God mold you so he can show and prove that the plan that he has for you is good. The plan he has for all of y'all is so good. And he wants the world to see it. So don't let the world put you into their mold. You get in God's mold. Amen. Amen. You know, the world, they think that we're particular. They think that we're strange. And, and to them we are. Jeremiah, in chapter 1, in verse 5, verse 5 through 12, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, an Amplified Classic, I knew and approved of you as my chosen instrument. I, before you were born, I separated you and set you apart, consecrating you. I'm going to skip to verse 8. It says, Be not afraid of them, their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand, he touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Verse 10, See, I have this day appointed you to the oversight of the nations and to the kingdoms to root out and pull down. To root out and pull down. We're supposed to be rooting out and pulling down. Yes. To destroy and to overthrow. You know, you can ride through your city and you can speak to things. God wants you to take authority. He wants you to pull down some strongholds, overthrow some things that aren't right. To build and to plant. He says he puts his words in your mouth so that you can build and plant. We're supposed to be building and planting. What are you speaking out of your mouth? The Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active watching over my word to perform it. Oh, I missed verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? He said, I see a branch or shoot of an almond tree. That in the, in the um, Amplified Classic says, that branch or shoot of the almond tree is the emblem of alertness and activity. Because you see, the almond tree, it would be one of the first ones to, to bloom, to blossom. But it took a long time for the fruit to show. 
But God said, that blossom, that is an indication of the emblem of alertness and activity. And the Lord said to me, you've seen well, for I'm alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. I'm here to tell you this morning that God is active and he is alert and he is watching over his word to perform it in your life. He's watching over his word to perform it in this church's life. And he said, we're supposed to be building. And we are supposed to be building. But he's watching over our words to perform it. Are you speaking the words of God? Because he's not watching over the words that are not his words. He's not watching over the words that are doubt and unbelief and contrary. He's watching over his words. Amen? So if you're excited about something, you talk about it. You talk about it. What are the things that excite you? Watch yourself. What do you find yourself talking about the most? Are you talking about the things of God as much as you were talking about other things? You know, I even ask myself, I'm like, you know, are you talking about God with as much as you're talking about pickleball? You know, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with people that play pickleball a lot. A lot of them aren't Christians. And I try to witness to them in little ways that I, that I can, you know. But a lot of times we're talking about the game. We're talking about different paddles. We're talking about this and that and the other. But God wants us talking about the things of God. Amen? Amen. So, desire follows attention. Now, you may say to yourself, I'm not that bowling over. I'm not what you're talking about. I don't have that zeal. Well, here's the way to remedy it. Give it attention. Start speaking things on purpose, with a purpose. Start saying, I'm excited about things of God. Start purposefully talking about the things of God. And, and cultivate that excitement on the inside of you. Amen? Ask God for it. He'll meet you where you're at. Number three, and I have got to hurry. Okay, number three, the difference between the two churches. The third thing God said to me is unity. Psalms 133 says, Behold, in the King James Version, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. It's as the dew of Hermon and the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For the Lord commanded a blessing, even life forevermore. You know, one time years ago, there was a woman who came and she was laying hands for people. And she said, do y'all have any anointing oil? And she sent somebody to get it. And so they were up here and she poured the oil. I'm not talking about, you know, normally ministers will do this little thing and they will touch you. But no. She poured the oil, and it was on their head, and it ran down, and it went down their clothes. It even ran down into the carpet and made a stain. But I'm telling you what, that's how the flow works. It's poured out on the head. It runs down to the body. If you cut yourself off by getting out of oneness, you cut off the flow. See, the unity, the unity, God says in the unity is where he commands the blessings. You know, if you're saying, I don't see the blessings of God working in my life. I'm a tither. I'm a giver. I go to church. All, I mean, all these things, and you're saying, I'm doing it, but you're not seeing the blessings. Are you walking in unity? Right. Are you in oneness? Because you could be cutting yourself off. Because you, you see, if a body's all linked together, we're all one, that, that oil, it'll, it'll pull down and it'll get on all of us. But if I cut my arm off and I throw it over here, you know, and the, and the oil's poured on me here, that piece over there is not going to get it. And when you're in discord and, and, and not in harmony, you're cutting yourself off from the body and you're not getting in that flow. Amen? Amen. So, Ephesians 4 in the Amplified says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal and beg you to walk, lead a life worthy of divine calling. Let's go to verse 2. Living as becomes you with complete lowliness and mind, humility, meekness, which is unselfishness, gentleness, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another and making allowances because you love one another. Instead of getting mad with people all the time, just give them some grace. Make, allow make allowances. You're not perfect. Why do we expect other people to be perfect? Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of the land and produced by the Spirit. Strive earnestly to guard and keep harmony. Now, Quincy and, and Katie, come, come here real quick. Let me show you what God wants you to do. So, I'm harmony and unity and peace, right? That's what I am. Now, Quincy is a guard. He's guarding, right? He's guarding me. I'm unity and peace. Now, if something tries to get at unity 
and peace. Try to get at me, Caden. See, he's guarding it. Thank you. Thank you. See, that's the, way God, that's the way God wants us to be. He wants us to take unity seriously. We're supposed to guard it earnestly. We're supposed to, I mean, he, he wants us serious about guarding that unity. We don't let anything come between. Amen? There's one body and one spirit. 1 Corinthians, let's read uh, chapter 1 and verse 10 and thir- to 13 in the Amplified Classic. But I urge and entreat you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in perfect harmony and full agreement in what you say, and there be no dissensions or factions or divisions among you, but you be perfectly united in your common understanding and in your opinions and judgments. For it has been made clear to me, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions and wrangling. Contentions and wrangling is basically just strife and arguments. And factions among you. So somebody in Chloe's household told they spilled the beans. <laughs> what I mean is this. Each one of you either says, I belong to Paul. Or I belong to Paul's. Or I belong to Cephas or Peter. Or, I belong to Christ. I belong with Pastor Eddie. I belong with Brother Milton. I belong with Josh. I belong with Ralph and Diane. I'm a part of the prayer group. I'm a part of this. No, that's not what he says. One body. We're one body. Is Christ the Messiah divided into parts? Was Paul crucified on behalf of you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? No. Now, write this down. Dissension, if you don't know what it is, is a disagreement that leads to discord. Dissension is a disagreement that leads to discord. The Bible says, let there be no dissensions. Let there be no disagreements that lead to discord. If you are in a situation in this church and something arises and an argument comes up that leads to discord, that's when you were in unity with your brother or sister, but now there's something, mm, it's just not quite right. The Bible says no. No. It's not worth unity. You've got to guard it the way Quincy was over here. You've got to keep it out. Okay? Now, a faction is a group or a clique within a larger group that has different opinions or interests than the larger group. So, if you're in the church, in in the church or in the body of Christ, and and let's look for purpose sake for our church right here, and the whole church says, we're going to do X, Y, Z. Or even like the building project. This is what we're doing. We're raising money. We're doing this. I want y'all to believe this. This is what we're speaking. This is what we're doing. We're but someone comes to you and pulls you over and says, hey, they get you, they get you, they get a couple people together and say, what do y'all think about that building? I mean, it's been a while now. I, I don't think we maybe we shouldn't go with that one. We, we ought to just do something cheaper right now. See, you're creating your own little group, and you're talking about something that, as a member of this church, you're supposed to be submitted to the head. Right. And the head, everything flows down from the head. Now, we've been, we've been given the vision, and this is the vision of the way we're moving forward. And if the vision is going to change, why would God tell the arm or the foot before he tells the head? Right. See? The Bible says no. Don't make factions. Don't make dissensions. Don't have dissensions. Proverbs 6 and verse 12 through 19 in the Amplified Classic says, A worthless person. Worthless. This is what the Bible says. You're worthless if you do this. A wicked man is he who goes out with a perverse, contrary, wayward mouth. He winks with his eyes. He shuffles his feet, tapping his feet. He makes signs with his hands, teaches fingers. Willful and contrary in his heart, he devises trouble, vexation, and evil continually. He lets loose discord and sows it. So this person is winking. They're, you know, hey, hey, hey. They don't look like the person that's sowing discord. The person sowing discord is going to be one of the most congenial persons in the church. They're not going to look like it. They might not seem like it. They're not going to look like the devil, and it's not, they're not going to have a sign across their shirt that says evil. Right. Amen? Right. 
Verse um, 14, willful and contrary in his heart, he devises trouble, vexation, and evil continually. He lets loose discord and sows it. Therefore upon him shall the crushing weight of calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken, and that without remedy. I'm telling you, if you're talking about things that you shouldn't be talking about and you're causing discord in the church, you need to stop it you need to repent because the Bible says that there's going to come a crushing weight of calamity. And it's going to come sudden and it's not going to have a remedy. It's going to be too late for you if you don't repent. Verse 17 says, A proud look, the spirit that makes one overestimate himself and under... No, I'm sorry, verse 16. These six things that the Lord hates, indeed seven are abomination to him. A proud look, the spirit that makes one overestimate himself, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that manufactures wicked thoughts and plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and he who sows discord among the brethren. If you sow discord among the brethren, God puts you in the same category as a murderer. Someone who has murdered innocent blood. That's how important it is to God that you don't sow discord. In church A, they don't let these little groups pop up. They don't. If, if somebody comes to them talking about stuff, if that person isn't willing to change and see the light of day, they're going, church A is going to take it straight to the pastor. We're going to cut it. We're going to cut it at the root. And I'm going to tell you something else. They don't care if you use their name. You hear, you hear me? If somebody comes to me trying to start trouble or saying something they shouldn't say, I'm going to speak up. And I'm not going to say, now don't, don't say you heard it from me. No, tell them that you heard it from me. I'm bold in the name of Jesus. Church B, the dying church, they have these little hater groups pop up all the time about every little thing. Every little thing somebody's going to get mad about and try to bicker and talk about. John 17, 23 says, I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. There are so many scriptures on unity and oneness and walking in love and not getting in strife. We could be here all day if I said them all. But I encourage each one of you, do a search. Do a study on unity. Seriously. Look in your concordance. Look up scriptures on unity and how important it is to God. And, and meditate on those verses this week. Now, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to go through these others. I'm just going to briefly mention. The fourth thing that is the difference is commitment. We all know the scripture in Hebrews 10, 25. This talks about don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So much more as the day approaches. Don't forget the assembling of the sake of yourselves together. You know, some people, <clears throat> they miss church so much. If something really bad happened to them, we would never know. I mean, we wouldn't know to check on them or not because we just think, well, you know, it's not the third Sunday yet. You know, because they only show up every third Sunday or if the creek, you know, if the Lord's willing, the creek don't rise. <laughs> I mean, it has to be perfect outside for them to show up. If something was really wrong, we would never know right. because no one has, but compared to somebody that's faithful, you're always there. There's some people here that if they're not there and they're not here 15 minutes early, I'm already, before church even starts, I'm wanting to text them, <laughs> you know? What's going on? Also, be a person of integrity. If you say, yes, I'll teach a class, show up. If you say, yes, I'll cut the grass, cut the grass. If you say, yes, I'll be on the cleaning team, get the schedule. Know the schedule. Don't make them have to remind you. Don't make them have to come behind you because you forgot. Be a person of integrity. Honor your commitments. Church A, people walk in, and they look around, and the place is pristine because the people are committed, and they're doing their parts. In church B, they pull up, the grass needs mowing, the cleaning person forgot to clean, the kids' class people didn't show up, it's just a mess. We don't want to be like them, amen? Number five, the fifth thing that God talked to me about, the difference between church A and B, is giving and serving. Now, I'm not just talking about money, but I'm talking about your resources. Whatever they may be, your time, your supply, your gifts, Amen? Romans 12, in verse 6 through 8 in the Amplified Classic, it says, Having gifts, faculties, talents, qualities that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. He whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. He whose gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. 
the Bible says, hey, if you're good at serving, find somewhere to serve. Amen? Amen. He who teaches, teach. To him who exhorts, encourage to his exhortation. He who contributes, let him do it in simplicity and liberality. Who, who gives aids and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind. There's that word zeal again. God wants us to be doing this, these things with zeal, with excitement. He wants you plugged in and doing your part and giving your part in the local church, in the body. And he wants you to be excited about it. Amen? Find your place. Get excited. He who does acts of mercy with genuine cheerfulness and joyful eagerness. Ephesians 4, verse 15 and 16 in the King James says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. We're supposed to be growing up. When we grow up, we're growing up into Christ. We're becoming more and more like him. Amen. Verse 16, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make it increase of the body unto edifying of itself in love. Each part fitly joined together, doing their role, giving it supply. You know, in, your, in our bodies, we know if one part isn't working right. You know? I mean, how bothered are we? You know, if one of your shoulders or your arms, it isn't feeling good or isn't working right. You know, it's not like, well, you had another shoulder. You don't need that one. No. I mean, you notice it. If you're not doing your part, if you're not giving a supply, it's noticed in the body. We need all the parts of the body working together, giving their supply. Amen? Now, I'm going to end with this. I love the way this says this. Ephesians 4.16 in the New Living Translation. He makes the whole body fit together, fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's what the church is all about, is, is so that we can grow, that we can become healthy, that we can become full of love. Amen? That's what we're here to do. So, to recap, let's be church A. Let's show honor. Let's get excited. Make sure that you're in unity. Be committed and give it your supply. Amen? Amen. 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 Mama, do you want to say anything or do you want me to close in prayer? Okay. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you for this day. I thank you, Father God, that you remind us of these things and you bring it to us this week. I thank you, Father God, as that we study in, about unity, Lord, in our personal time. I thank you, Father God, that you will join us together even closer as I thank you for the oneness that we have in this body. And we worship you and we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for all the things that you're doing in our lives and in this church and in this community, Father God, in the nation, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for your glory. Oh, Father God, we want to see it more and more. I thank you, Lord, that we are excited about the things of God and that we are growing even more excited, Father. I thank you, Lord, that we want to see signs and wonders and miracles. And, Father, that the norm is just not going to cut it anymore for us. We're going to be a church that rises up. We stand up and we take our place in the Spirit. No longer are we going to be settling, Father God, for the scraps because we're sons and we're daughters, Father God. I thank you, Lord, that we're rising up. Faith Family Church is a church that is rising up, Father God. I thank you, Lord, that as things flow down from the head, from Jesus, Father God, and they flow down and you give the vision to our pastor, I thank you, Father God, that we're the body and that we're joined together and that we are fit together, Father, that we come up underneath him, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that just like you said, that oil that runs down from the head, I thank you, Father God, that that oil that run down, it runs down on top of us, Father God. Oh, Father God, it's running down us all the way down, Father, saturating us, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that we are a church that's saturated. And we're going to take that flow. And that flow is going to flow out into the world. And the people around us. So that they can know Jesus. We thank you for these things. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.